Perfectionism isn't productive, and it actually can affect your general health, your productivity, your creativity, your self-esteem, and so much more. And in today's episode, Alex and I dive into what perfectionism has looked like in our life and what it currently looks like. So we hope you guys enjoy it. Make sure that you like, comment, subscribe, and share this with a friend you think would really enjoy it. We'll catch you on the inside. So you had a pretty crazy night last night. <laughs> we both did. We what? had a pretty crazy night. And I, I have a story to open up with is that uh, last night we had a fire alarm at 4 a.m. And my experience with this was <laughs> <laughs> quite wild. And so I am what I believe to be on the tail end of a dream and I'm getting into very light sleep before this alarm goes off, right? And so I'm already kind of, awakening and then that alarm goes off and i kid you not i jumped out of bed so i was like spider-man as <laughs> soon as i heard that alarm i jumped up and i was like on all fours yeah. and i was like surveying the area and i'm like sue fire 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 <laughs> gus isn't moving gus hasn't moved he at is all still curled up in his bed doing nothing so then i obviously make sure that you're awake and moving and then i just sprint out <laughs> of the room Four o'clock in the morning, I sprint out of the room, rush down. I rush through the upstairs, making sure it's nothing up there, nothing upstairs. Go to this, go to the main floor, go everywhere, go to all the fireplaces. Nothing is going on there. Go out to the garage, go around the outside. In this entire experience, I'm just in my boxers <laughs> running around the entire house. I mean, what if there was a fire? I'm just standing outside now in my boxers. Could have probably put on pants and maybe it's cold outside. It would have been a good idea. Go down to the basement. There's absolutely nothing. So then I'm like, are you serious? We didn't even grab anything. I didn't grab a single thing. thing. Because afterwards I was thinking, you know how people say, okay, if your house is on fire, of course, like the first priority is the people and the dogs. But I didn't even think about grabbing anything. Oh, I didn't grab a single thing. I wasn't like, oh, I should grab my laptop. I should grab this memento. I just was up and out. I grabbed my phone. And I didn't that's have a all. phone. We would have lost it all. But anyway, <laughs> uh, went around. There was nothing. And so then. Uh, and it was like a voice. It wasn't just a fire alarm that went yeah. off. It was like a monitored, not a monitored voice. Like what? what's the word I'm looking I don't know. for? It, was, it said fire. Like a pre-recorded voice. Yeah. It was just like fire. fire. It was a woman's voice. And it was so weird. And Alex even asked, I thought it, was a dream. thought it was in his dream or if it was real. I was like, that was real life happening. But it only went off once. And it was the only, the alarm was upstairs. It didn't go like all the alarms in the house went off. Yeah. And we even checked our alarm system. Yeah, the security system and everything. Didn't say anything. So weird. So I do still think it was kind of a dream that we were both having at the same time. Uh, no, I think it really happened. I don't know. And then we, I, we get back in bed. It's now four ten. I mean, we jolted around the house. I've never <laughs> ran that fast in my entire cortisol life. Cortisol spike through, the, through roof. the roof. Well, Sue says cortisol through the roof. I look over <laughs> in about five minutes from the time we laid back down. I was oh. not snoring. You were talking to me. Are you kidding me? You were snoring up a storm. I'm like, oh, this is just, you're able to fall asleep I'm like this. <laughs> I'm like, I'm my heart is still beating outside of my chest. And I'm like, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> One more time. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I guess I'm just going to sit here and hopefully I can go back to sleep. Because I got dressed as if the day was going to start because I was like, there's no way I'm going back to sleep. And I see her. She's already back in bed. <laughs> that I, I laid back down. I'm still having a conversation. He comes in. He goes, are you already asleep? <laughs> I'm ready for the day. And I said, no, I'm just laying down because I knew with the time I went to bed, getting up at four wasn't going to was serve a terrible me. Idea. Yeah. And so I was hoping even if I didn't fall back asleep, I could just lay in bed, not my phone, no comp nothing, just lay in bed for 45 minutes or 50 minutes and hopefully be in bed until 5.30 instead of getting up at 5 just to give myself that rest. I didn't think that went all the way through. I actually just got right back in bed when she was in bed with the clothes that I had on for the day. <laughs> I was like, I'll lay here, but I highly doubt I go back to sleep. I ended up falling back asleep and sleeping for like an hour. But. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's my story for today. <laughs> it was a great start to my day. I don't encourage it. Um, if, if, I still don't know what happened. <laughs> maybe yeah. the house is on fire. And I hope it doesn't happen tomorrow because that would be terrible. If it oh, goes off at miserable. four o'clock in the morning tomorrow, that'd be very Why bad. Why would you say that? Well, it's a possibility. Why? I don't know. Let's get into today's topic. Before I have okay. a question. All right. I was thinking about this and I'm really interested to hear your answer. If you were... In a cartoon, if you were a cartoon character, what would be your outfit? Because, you know, cartoons, they don't change their outfits. They're wearing the same thing every day. What would be your outfit as a cartoon? What's fascinating is that this has nothing to do with the story, nor does it have to do with today's topic. This is just I didn't out there. say it did. I'm just surprised that it came about. Um, I have no idea. With the most recent events, I feel like I'm the roadrunner. So <laughs> near his outfit seems like probably a good fit for me. Okay. Seriously, what would be your go-to clothes? I just told you. The Roadrunner doesn't wear clothes. Exactly. Nude. <laughs> if you were a car cartoon character, you would just be nude. Yeah. It's probably a good storyline for me to start with. Oh, goodness. What about you? Well, mine, easy peasy. I would do the outfit that basically is my everyday outfit. Okay. I would have sweats on for sure as a cartoon. <laughs> no questions asked. Then I would have socks on high socks or, you know, above your ankle. Then I would have either slippers or slides on with that. And I would have either a t-shirt or a sweatshirt on. And that would be my absolute everyday outfit as a cartoon. It is my everyday go-to. Yeah, it wasn't much different. Uniform. But it was fun to think about and picture myself as a cartoon. Sure. You're no fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Today, I thought we could talk a little bit about perfectionism. It's a good topic. We came across this topic because you're actually listening to a Joe Rogan podcast episode in 1961, which it's crazy to think about that high of numbers of podcasts. We'll get there. For a while. We'll get there one of these days. But is with Peter Atia, and they were talking all about perfectionism. And this is something Alex and I have had a lot of conversations on. It is uh, in the episode. Well, Peter Tia has a new book out, and so he is doing his rounds of all the podcast and talking about the new book and all that. And uh, I think a portion of the book, I haven't, I haven't read the book, but he talks about his battle with perfectionism and how he has navigated through it, how he has overcome it. And uh, his story resonated with me a bunch because a, a lot of the pieces that he spoke about or experiences that he had, I resonated with. What were some of those experiences that he talks about that you felt that you resonated with? I think the aspect in which he found perfectionism or striving for perfect circumstances in absolutely everything and the challenge of, of negative self-talk that he chronically faced to such a strong point of frustration and anger that presented from it. That is a lot of what my experience with perfectionism has been and, and uh, a lot of just how my mind has worked. How long would you say, do you feel like you've been a perfectionist as long as you can remember? Or do you feel like it came about at a certain age? I would say as long as I can remember for the sheer fact of a lot of the things in my life were very centered around you do well, you receive a reward. Um, and so I just made the assumption because of my environment, because of the way my, my brain works, I suppose that with good quality work, with the best quality of work that I'm going to get the response that I want, or I'm going to get the praise that I desire and, and those different factors. With perfectionism, one really interesting in the clip that you showed me was him talking about perfectionism as an addiction. And I think a lot of times people look at perfectionism as not a flaw at all, as it's something that people actually admire or give praise to and put on a pedestal because it's admirable to other people for you to want to be great and want to be perfect. And his concept was talking about the fact that it might not be um, you might not think of it the same, but you are 
really thirsting and needing to have that same outcome of having perfect circumstances or having a perfect experience every time you go into it. Just like, let's say, an alcoholic is always needing that drink. And if you go to a bar as an alcoholic and you ask for a drink and they give you water, your addiction isn't being quenched. And it's the same as if you're a perfectionist and you go to do a task and you're not perfect in it, of that's not being quenched. And that's where a lot of that negative self-talk comes into play. He used another analogy in the sense of you're not being celebrated if you are gambling all your money away. No one is like, yeah, keep doing it. You're doing a great job. You should keep doing this. Whereas for the person who is dealing with perfectionism and and a lot of negative self-talk, as they accumulate their accolades as they continue to move up the ladder or uh, create greater wealth or or accomplishments for themselves, they're getting celebrated. And so it's can it's consistently reinforcing something that needs to be better addressed because it's not simply a matter of you shouldn't want to accomplish things. You shouldn't want to be better for yourself. It's the route in which you're taking it and and how you're treating yourself, how you're speaking to yourself. That is the conversation relative to it being like, if if I'm not perfect, then I can't accomplish things. Or if I, if I lose this mentality, then I, I can't accomplish what I want to accomplish. Yeah. I actually looked up uh, some of the definitions of perfectionism because I know what perfectionism is to me, but I wanted to be able to put a definition to it. And one of them was the need to be or appear to be perfect or even believe that it's possible to achieve perfection. Or perfectionism in psychology is a broad personality trait characterized by a person's concern with striving for flawlessness and perfection and is accompanied by critical self-evaluations and concerns regarding others' evaluations. And that's what I connected to the most was just that critical self-evaluation time and time again. And it's so accurate with you saying it's not lowering your standards or it's not wanting to be great. I've always wanted to be number one. I've always wanted to be great. And there's a lot of stories that my mom has told about me, even as young as in elementary school, of needing to be perfect in a sense. And Along with that came so much negative self-talk, and that's what I really have worked on more than not striving for greatness, because I still strive for greatness. I still strive for that number one, but I recognize there's no reason to beat myself down for not being perfect. It's about taking the next step forward, learning from what happened, and being able to give myself a little bit of grace. And I always thought I shouldn't give myself grace because I'm just making an excuse for what's going on in my life. But there is a quite a difference between making excuses and being the victim in your life versus being able to understand the circumstance at play and giving yourself grace and just just not completely deteriorating yourself for one small thing. I think that the perfectionism mentality is almost the easy way out because you're putting yourself into a situation where as as soon as something goes wrong, you're just beating yourself up. You're not actually analyzing why the thing went wrong or, or understanding why things went a different way. You're just immediately uh, telling yourself, you're an idiot, you suck, and creating frustration. And so it's a very emotional response. It has nothing really tactical to it. And then you don't actually have an actionable plan moving forward to not have the same outcome. You're just, I need to do better. And then just getting right back into the same method of work, thus, th- that would be the, the definition of, of insanity in that sense of things where you're doing the same action with the thought that you're going to have a a different outcome. And so by utilizing perfectionism as kind of this crutch of of negative self-talk, and this is what I expect out of myself, and this is what I should always do, you're really just taking the easy way out of not actually understanding what's going on. And by allowing yourself to get into a calm environment and zoom out and really analyze why did this situation become this outcome and giving yourself actual reasoning as to why that was the case is a much more powerful place for you to be. And 
it is so much more beneficial for you moving forward to actually make change and to not have the same outcome moving forward. And that's where really the, the power resides and, and uh, allowing for yourself to, to be a better version of you. I was spending far too much time being critical instead of using critical thinking. And that's exactly how I got myself into the position where I couldn't keep excelling because I couldn't critically look at what was going on. I could only berate myself for not being good enough or for not being perfect. And within the perfectionism, I, I think that one thing for me is I had to do things consecutively in, in the sense that, and and you and Miguel give me a little bit of grief on this. Miguel and I have worked on, on scripts for different pieces of content and he'll give me grief. I'll write a full sentence and bits and pieces of it will be right, but I will delete it all. I will just start from scratch because I'm like, I, I don't want any of what I previously said, I just want to do it perfect from start to finish type situation. And that is one, not necessary. And that's a very small component of this, but a portion of what we're trying to have conversation on and, and create awareness around and, and those different factors. And I think that uh, allowing for yourself to have these small missteps and recognizing them and then being able to move forward and not allowing yourself to fixate and create a much more significant situation than what it actually is, is very important as well. What are things that you feel like in life, and maybe you have corrected since, because I feel like we have both improved a lot with perfectionism. And it's kind of funny because I used to say I'm a recovering perfectionist because I didn't feel like I was perfectly recovered from it. But that word, and especially talking about addiction, fits so perfectly of working through that. But within perfectionism, what are things in your life that you feel like you've missed out on or not been able to excel in because of your perfectionism? I would say that I'm just getting in my own way. A lot of the things that I want to accomplish I am adding an extra barrier of immense difficulty that has no necessity of being there, of trying to make sure that I have gone through every aspect of, if, if I'm going to speak publicly or I'm going to create a piece of content, I would just go through every piece of, of that content or verbiage that I'm utilizing and think about every single caveat that people would bring to my attention from that. That is extremely tiresome and to a degree unnecessary. I think that there are, this is like anything in moderation, this makes sense. It's a useful tool. It's good for me to think about what some of the rebuttals or some of the uh, kickbacks or, or comments that are going to be made so that I have an understanding of, of it being addressed, or maybe I change the piece of content and how it's being said. But the obsession of it to a point where there's a lot of pieces of content that I have wanted to put out that I have talked myself out of because I have this negative spiral of well, if this, then that, and then if this person says this, then I'm going to X, Y, and Z. And then I'll, I've listened to the, the piece of content, for example, so many times that no one wants to hear this because I'm so annoyed with it now. <laughs> and so then I don't end up posting those things. And uh, that's just a you know, simple example there. But I also think that it has been something where I am more shy and, and personal or like in, in conversation or what have you, because I don't want to sound silly, or I don't want to uh, sound dumb in, in different scenarios or whatever that situation is. And I think that I've gotten significantly better than I once was. I think that there's a lot more progress to be made on that side of things, but I, I have made progress. And I would say that I've missed out on experiences and relationships, quality of, of flourishing relationships because of it. As And, and, I, and I, I don't want to say it in a sense that it's the only reason, right? Yeah. It's it's a factor within a, a greater component of things. But I would say that it's a big rock to some of those different things. What are some of the situations that you feel like you've maybe missed out on or it's it's had application to? I feel like I was, I deterred myself so much from trying anything that I wasn't quote, inherently good at, or the first time trying it, I wasn't good at it because I did just want to be perfect. I did just want to excel in what I was doing. And I 
didn't want to fail so much that I hid myself from any failure. And in that, I not only shielded myself from trying things that I could have excelled in or I could have really enjoyed, but I also made the perfectionism worse because I didn't try as many new things because I didn't want to fail at them. It was a literal safeguard of if I don't do this, I can't mess up and I can't fail. And I think that there are so many things in my life looking back through that lens of I really truly at the root of it didn't do that because I didn't want to look silly. I didn't want to look stupid. I didn't want to fail. I didn't want to see anyone to see me not being my best. And that is something I've I've let down a lot and being able to not be the best at things. And some of that's come from our relationship of seeing the amount of love that you have for me as a person and knowing that if I fail in front of you, it's not that you're going to sit here and judge me. You're still going to sit here and love me. And that's helped me break out of my shell as well as a lot of inner work that I've had to do and being able to recognize, like I talked about, the difference between an excuse and grace and being able to just not beat myself to complete obliteration for something that didn't need it. Something as small as, for example, this morning, because I did go back to sleep, I didn't wake up when I wanted to wake up. Something like that in the past would have completely ruined my day. It would have been, you are so stupid. You're a piece of shit. You can't even get up at your fucking alarm. How can you expect to do anything else if you can't even wake up at the time that you said you were going to wake up? And that would be running through my head the rest of the day. And I would put so much guilt on myself to feel like I had gotten the brunt of the deservingness of what I didn't do, of you didn't do this thing, you deserve to feel bad about it, and I'm going to make you feel bad about it the rest of the day because that's what you deserve because you're a piece of shit. And that that's not necessary at all, and that doesn't help or change anything like you were saying earlier of it didn't get me any better. I just kept doing the same thing time and time again in hopes that it would turn out differently. I wasn't using that critical thinking to really reflect and see what was the reason that you didn't wake up on time. Was it truly some of your own doing where it can be and there's a lot of responsibility to be taken there, but It's not taking so much responsibility that you are just beating yourself down and down and down. It's taking the responsibility, taking the next step, and moving on with your day. And that's been one of the biggest changes for me is recognizing what happened, but also recognizing the weight of what I need to put on what happened and being able to take the next step forward. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. I I think that one of the things that I have a strong regret for is the lack of documentation that I did as physique development was being built. I wish that I would have documented every single day because I I wish that I had the ability to look back and really see where my head was at on a day-to-day basis because I'm sure that there's a ton of overlap with some of the adversity that I feel now um, and and the ways that I, I feel challenged and all those different factors. It's just at a different level or it's a, it's a different way of it being expressed to me in those different factors. And I think that my perfectionism or my thought process that someone is doing it better than me and I don't need to put myself out there because I don't want to look silly caused me to to not do that. And, and in hindsight, I wish I would just document every moment. And that's a, a big reason as to why we document as much as we do now, because I, I want to have all of this as a, uh, you know, be able to look back in 10 years and, and really talk about the story that we were able to build this and, and those different factors. And I think that that's a, an important thing to for me to realize as a whole and uh, to continue to 
make a priority as we press forward, even if I continue to have those type of feelings. And you speak to that negative self-talk that you have experienced, and this morning would have been an example. I will say that where I am the best at managing it is when I'm well-rested. When I'm in the, the best position from a rest I am, it's much easier for me to deal with the negative self-talk. But as I get more exhausted and, I, and I'm more beat down and all those different factors, that is where I'm just in a vulnerable state. And I can get overcome by that negative self-talk and really let it dictate a lot of my actions and, and how I am sp obviously speaking to myself and those things. And with clients specifically, this is one thing that we constantly, not constantly, but will consistently have conversation on is we have to look at it from a, a lens of where are we performing from? What is our, our grade from just our starting point? Are we under 50% from a recovery standpoint and we're not having good sleep? Our, our kids are waking us up throughout the night. We haven't had a good meal in two or three days. We've been on the go. We haven't had good digestion. Like We're functioning at 30 or 40% of our efficiency. Why are we taking into account what our, our brain is trying to tell us right now? We've got things that we know we can take care of. Let's focus on these different factors rather than allowing for ourselves to just beat ourselves up. It's it's not worth our time, nor is there anything productive about it. We know what we need to fix. There's no reason to, to listen to the voice. And so that is a, a really important thing to take into consideration as well, because it's, it's not something that you're always going to have control over, right? It's, it's something that's going to have its ebbs and flows, and you've got to be able to rise to the occasion and, and understand the circumstances so that you can navigate through it to your best ability. And I think with the amount of data and biofeedback we take into consideration for clients, we're able to show them that in front of their eyes of it's not just me trying to make you feel better. It's not just me trying to tell you you're doing a good job and because I want you to just feel good. It's if we look at the data you had piss poor sleep, you've been on the go, you've been traveling, you cannot expect everything to be you feeling at 100% or you performing at 100%. And it's also really important to recognize 100% one day looks different than 100% another day based on what you have to give. And once I recognize that of I'll have days that are kick-ass where I am on top of the world. I'm doing everything I need to be doing. I just feel awesome all day. And then there's days where maybe I'm under-recovered. There's other things going on. And I really push that day and I give a lot. But it didn't look the same as the other day. But that was me giving 100% that day. And once I came to terms with that of this was your 100% of what you had to give that day, that brought a lot more peace to me and being able to see those ebbs and flows. And like you were talking about of control, I love that you brought that up because perfectionism can be a way to control the world and other things. And I think mine came from that of this is something I can I think I can control or it's going to give me control and I'm being praised for having this control. And I was using that as a way to feel more comfortable in my life where exactly what you said at the beginning, it was actually holding me back and it was the easy way out to do it that way. I think that it, it puts you in a position with that control to where you believe that you can dictate the outcome of every yes. possible mm. thing. And the reality is, and, and as you take those steps back and, and really understand what all goes into each variable that you're thinking about, there's very little that's actually within your control. And this is actually a very liberating feeling rather than it being something of defeat. And this is what I thought, is that I thought it would be very defeating to really step back and, and understand that there's significantly less that's within my control. And it's liberating because the things that are within your control make a big difference. And by focusing on just those few things, you're able to make massive strides within whatever the endeavor is, and you're able to stay so much more centered rather than dwelling on the things that were actually outside of your control to begin with. And you, it just frees up your your headspace, your much more clear thinking, all those different factors. And we can, with 
this uh, podcast being significantly health centered, right? We can talk about this from a training and nutrition perspective. And this, this allows for us to um, give a, a quality example where you have a, a desired body that you're wanting to achieve. You have a, a way that you want to look, a, a way that your arms and your legs and your glutes need to look. And it may be a picture of someone else. The reality is, is that there's only so many things that are within your control. You're not going to be able to control you looking exactly like your favorite fitness model type situation. Can you grow your glutes like she has grown her glutes potentially? Sure. But are they going to look the same? Probably not. It's not a certain type of program. It's not a certain type of exercise or a certain diet that you should follow, but you should be following a training program that's going to be prioritizing your glutes. And that's something that you can control. You can track your nutrition and, and prioritize the quality of your sleep and all these different factors, but it's not so much that you have control over looking a very specific way like someone else. And I think that that's a, an important thing to understand. I stopped letting the things that I couldn't control literally ruin my day and just focused on controlling the controllables. And when you said that, all I wanted to do was retweet, like, repost, because that it's just so much of where my brain was at for so long of thinking that I had control over everything. And even when we first met, and my, my sister and my family can definitely uh, – back this up, I, if something changed in a day, I threw me off. I was not someone that you could say could go with the flow. It was something changed and it was very much so out of my control most of the time. And I would just shut down. I would throw a fit. I would shut down. I would pout. I would do anything but take the next step forward. And I would say that over the past five or six years, I have improved greatly in that of I, instead of freaking out, I'm looking, what is the next step? Where can I pivot? What needs to be done from here? Because it was also extremely freeing to realize I can't go back and change anything. So instead of dwelling on it, instead of being sad and complaining about it and saying it's not fair, what is the next step that I can do? Where can I pivot and what direction can I go to keep this going forward? And that's a trait that I'm so thankful to have truly adopted instead of letting it just completely ruin my day. Two tools I use in, in that setting where the schedule gets thrown off because I do prefer to function off of a well-structured schedule where I'm getting a lot of the things that I need to get done, done. And I would say that almost everyone can you know, agree with that. So two things that I do, I've talked about this on the podcast. I have a structure to my day where I, I split it up into thirds. And so I have my morning activities, my afternoon and my evening activities. And so I look at that as separate days and I will track of was my morning task, were they a win or a loss, e afternoon and evening being the same way. And my goal is to win two thirds two out of three. If I can win three out of three, that's amazing. And in these scenarios, my morning may be off, but I can still win my afternoon and my evening. Another avenue that I, I venture down here is that I will take a step back and pull out a pen and paper. I think that writing is the easiest way for me to really navigate through what my thoughts are. If I just sit there and try to think through things, it doesn't help the same way. And so what I'll do is that I will ask myself, what is one thing that I can do right now that is going to allow for me to still win the day. And this varies from time to time. It could be I need to buckle down and get to work. I need to work hard with, with no distractions for the next two hours. And if I do that, I'll be happy. I, I, I finish the day strong. It is what it is. Sometimes that's a, uh, a moment where I need to call a friend. I just need to call someone and have good conversation for an hour 90 minutes, I need to laugh, I need to disconnect, and that's what allows for me to win the day. Because there's many times where you have 
uh, seen me have not great days and I'll go on a walk. I'll call one of my close friends and then my mood has done a complete 180. Flipped upside down. I couldn't care less about what happened during the day because now I'm, I'm good. I'm happy. This was a victory to me. I'll take today as a win. And so that's always going to be dependent on the scenario. Do I have the, do I have the willpower or the bandwidth to really dig back into work? Cool. I'll, I'll do that. If I don't, like there are other things that I need to do to still win my day. And it's not just a matter of, well, this was on my to-do list. I have to do this because the reality is, is that it, it's the job's going to, to get done regardless but I always want my work to be at a a hundred percent or the quality of my work, the effort that's being put in to be top tier. And that's, that doesn't go alongside the perfectionism. That's just a expectation that I have for myself as well as I'm working for individuals that also rightfully so expect that out of me as well. And so those are two ways that I navigate through my schedule being skewed, if you will. I love those. And I feel you have grown specifically a ton in the past six months of being able to really be in tune with what you need and what is the win for that scenario instead of just looking at it of the only way to win is to do X. And that's been so invigorating, honestly, for me to see of you because I just see you so much happier than beating yourself down for not winning the prize that you put up and not to say it was an arbitrary prize, but it was one you notated as this is the only way to win the day. And you've been able to really learn about what I need to get in tune with to be able to show up in this moment or to win this moment based on where I'm at and taking true inventory of that and taking the next step forward. I think that's a conversation within perfectionism of it it does not only impact you, it impacts the other individuals around you, whether that be from a stray shot of, of anger and frustration that has nothing to do with your significant other or uh, just loved ones around you in general, that they're, they're catching a stray bullet for no reason whatsoever that they have to be understanding of, or it, they're like, you're in a rough position. Now, if you're not being understanding that now it's turning into, let's say an argument that certainly was unnecessary. It had, it had, it, and, and the frustration that ignited the argument has nothing to do with the argument. Right. And so understanding that you're not only impacting yourself, you're impacting everyone around you as well. And everyone around you wants you to be successful, wants you to achieve the goals that you want to achieve. Right. But wants you to do it in a way that is going to be productive for everyone, I suppose, that is going to be, I, I should say, conducive for everyone to to thrive and, th- and and flourish, not just this kind of, what I've, I see perfectionism and, and negative self-talk and, and the extreme nature of it as more destructive than constructive. And understanding that is is very important. When we first started filming more regularly or just started filming with Miguel, let's say back in 2020, what do you feel like perfectionism has looked like over our time filming? Because you have been on camera a lot more. And I remember the times filming where you would get very frustrated if you didn't say things absolutely perfect. You couldn't change the way you said something from one take to another, even if it was going to feel a little bit more natural, because that's the exact words you wanted to say. And if you didn't say those, then it was a bad take and you needed to do it again. But at the same time, you were in front of people and you didn't want a bad take. And so there was frustration building within that. How has that changed for filming now or what have you done to be able to grow within that as we filmed? I would say being kinder to myself. That's like the the easiest one. It's not easy to to do, but more so easy in the sense of, of highlighting because in the thought process of mis misspeaking or or saying it differently than I had desired to, it would just turn into a very negative spiral as a whole. And so I just had expected myself to be able to go out and say exactly how I wanted to, exactly what I should say, and it'd be perfect because I I I know what I'm talking about. And so in my mind, because I know what I'm talking about, it should just flow effortlessly. 
and to a degree it does. I think that in front of camera, it's a much different experience than knowing it when I'm uh, talking even on camera to just a client. When I'm talking one-on-one or I'm having conversation with you, it's much different than the lights and the multiple cameras and all those different factors. And so getting through that as well as the repetitions helping tremendously. Because at, at this point, I'm much more comfortable in front of the camera. I actually almost prefer to be in front of the camera because it's just, I, I enjoy it. Um, and so that the repetitions being more kind to myself, giving myself grace, being big parts. Also not having a firm script of what I'm wanting to say, having more of a, a bullet point nature of these are the things that I want to talk about. Let myself talk more freely because that's what's going to feel more comfortable for me as well as more comfortable for the person receiving it. It's not as robotic as this perfectly scripted text that I had put together for teaching on this particular topic. And I I look back and, and I think about my favorite professors, for example, none of them were that rigid. A lot of them had bullet points like I talked about and allowed stories and allowed for them to really just go off the cuff and, and immerse the consumer in a experience to allow for them to understand what's being talked about, to talk about it in a way that is easy to consume and digest. And I realized for myself that that is something that I strive for, that I feel as though that I do a great job with. And that all just comes from me in turn, that's not me writing necessarily. That's not me writing a script. That's just me talking and understanding who I'm talking to and all those different factors. And so allowing myself to just trust in my abilities and not to put myself in this situation where I was immediately thinking of all of my mentors or, or people who I would believe to be better than me at the thing. I was putting myself in this arena that they were the only ones watching. And I was giving that exact same presentation or video or what have you and allowing for what I believe those people would say to just be rocks thrown at me during that whole time. And that's one, not tr- not <laughs> true. I, I think that a lot of the, the mentors that I have, one, they are um, amazing individuals and would they, they would never come at me with with anger or frustration that like I'm an idiot that and and they, the the mentors that are coming to my mind right now none of them have ever come to me that way they may send me something and say hey what what if you thought about it in this way what if you framed it more this way what's your thought process here and that's on a one on one situation they're not jumping in my comments trying to dunk on me <laughs> and in my mindset that's what would happen if i if i screwed up then they were going to come in my comments and just dunk on me and and embarrass me type situation never has that ever happened type situation and i'm sure at some point someone is going to try and dunk on me and i am in an emotional place at this point in my life that i understand how to navigate through that i think that two years ago, three years ago version of me had no idea how to navigate through that. That was the most fearful thing I had probably. And it's so silly to think about now that that was something I was so scared of because it is a blimp in time. It literally happens. You respond, you have conversation, you hash it out and that's it. There's, there's nothing, it's not now everyone's viewpoint is that you're an idiot and that person's comment or what they said range true and that you have no validity any longer. And I, I truly did probably view it that way uh, to, a, to an extent. And so navigating through that and getting the repetitions, being more kind to myself, all being variables that helped me tremendously. And what do you feel like your experience has been when it's come to feedback? Because I know for myself, I took all feedback extremely negatively. And even feedback from you of you would say something, not trying to be hateful, not trying to dunk on me, but just exactly of, have you thought of it this way? And I would take it negatively of, so you hated everything that I wrote. You thought that it was stupid. Or so my ideas just suck. But I've learned and still am learning, I'm a work in progress, that when it comes to feedback, uh, you 
it's a gift. Feedback is such a gift. And if someone cares enough, and now I'm not, when I say feedback, I'm not saying anyone who makes a comment or gives their advice on your life. I'm talking about people that you have either asked for feedback or trust their opinion on feedback, not just anything anyone says. But feedback is such a gift to truly allow you to improve as a person. But I definitely haven't always viewed it that way. So what would you say your experience has been with feedback over the past few years? Feedback is so important. And I I think that this is something that I crave, honestly, within, within feedback. It's something where if I reach out to someone that I trust and that I want their opinion, the last thing I want to hear is, this is good. Go ahead. Like I, I know what I put out is going to be good, if not great. I need feedback on what's needs to be better. Like as, as much as I appreciate the thumbs up, I am asking you for direct feedback of even the smallest detail, what could be better? Because I, I desire to, to hear that more so. And so I honestly get more frustrated when I get the thumbs up of, yeah, keep it going, dude, keep rolling. Because that <laughs> drives me. And, and, and sometimes, and this is something I'm working through myself, truly, that is a legitimate <laughs> answer. There may not be something that everyone has to pick apart type situation. But if I'm seeking feedback, I, I want to hear it. And so navigating through the feedback is something where you have to be in a place to receive it as well as how it's framed and being given to you is very important as well. And I think that oftentimes individuals who are giving feedback wait too long because they don't know Mm -hmm. when to give the feedback. And so they get to a point where they may be, if it's a repetitive thing, they're too annoyed. And so then it comes from a kind of a harsh place of you're getting on my nerves, fix this. And that person's, I didn't even, I didn't even know that was happening. I'm, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. And so now you're in this kind of emotional place within that individual of, I, I did not mean to irritate you this much. And in rea- in reality, if you would have just said something the first time, this would have been a much easier conversation. And so that's, that's one. And so framing it and, and being in an environment to where that person's ready to receive feedback. So if you're giving feedback, I think that it's important if you are not, you're close with the individual. I think that asking, can I give you some some feedback on on what I thought of your presentation or or what I thought of how you did that? And if they say no, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Don't th- like that is not your time to be like, well, even though you said no, I'm going to give it to you anyway. Like if they say no, le- let it be and and maybe come back to it another time. But if they say yes, this is a a quality time for you to connect with that person because giving quality feedback one shows how much you care and two is really helpful for that person because we are are certainly from a societal perspective in a place where surrounding yourself with yes men is kind of the the narrative that is being pushed. Like you want people around you that are thinking the same, talking the same and agreeing on all your topics. And that is honestly the last place that I want to be. I want to be able to have constructive conversation and build on what I think now and have that thought be challenged by other individuals who I appreciate and who I um, want to know more about or, or know more about how they think. And so giving feedback is is important receiving feedback is also something where not everything is so personal do not take it from such a place that whatever is being said about an action that you took or a uh, piece of work that you had is a attack on you as an individual because that is nine times out of ten not the case and if the person is giving you the feedback and being malicious to make it personal it's probably not quality feedback to begin with. It's it's probably coming from a place of emotion on their side as well, and they're intentionally trying to hurt you. And so at that point, that feedback is like, eh, there's probably a bit of truth to what's being said, but the reality is as a whole, it's probably not the most valuable feedback that you should hang your hat on type situation. And so being in a place where you can receive and digest and not just immediately respond with emotion of, well, I, I did that because of this. Or, or giving a reasoning as to why that's the case. Although that may be a, a valuable response, it may not be the best response for you in the sense of really taking that in and understanding 
why that feedback was the feedback type situation, and then potentially being more constructive in the sense of, okay, well, this is what I I thought, and this is why I put this together, but I understand where you're coming from with that, and I can improve on that moving forward type situation. And so with feedback, it is something that I've had to work on so much because within the perfectionism and the negative self-talk, everything is made personal. Everything, everything is personal because I, as the the perfectionist, you are like, your work is you, it is personal. So if they are taking a jab at your work or, or saying that you're not doing something well, it is personal because you are connecting those two things are intertwined. They're one and the same. And so that by disconnecting those things and I'm the person and this is my work is a challenge and a hurdle to work through, therapy to work through, and a lot of self-development to get to. And once you get to that place, receiving feedback's a lot easier. (laughs) It's a lot easier. (laughs) Yeah. I think being able to, we even just yesterday morning had a conversation about feedback of, I asked you a question, but I felt the way I phrased it, that you could have taken it personally or maliciously. And I wanted to ensure that you didn't. And I'd asked the question via Slack. And then when we saw each other in person, even though you didn't respond in a negative way, I just wanted to touch base with you and see if there was a better way for me to ask that question. Was there a better way for us to have that conversation? And I think not getting so defensive and being able to really just sit down and have that conversation. And you had mentioned, hey, some of it's on me of you shouldn't have to think about every way that I could feel about this when asking me a simple question. And I need to improve on that. And I think that the way you asked it was fine. Maybe it could have been asked this way. But all in all, I think that that was a good way to phrase it. And it's always helpful for me when you offer either a solution or an idea to asking that question instead of just asking it. And that was such a productive conversation to have because it's not that it came from a place of, oh, we screwed something up and now we need to have this conversation. It was more of a proactive conversation of, I want to learn how to communicate with you better. And I want to learn how to give you feedback better or be able to get to a conclusion better. And that came from both of us dropping our shields, dropping the guards and just being able to converse of this is truly how I felt about it. And this is what you can do to help. But this is also what I need to do to help the situation. It was a very productive conversation. I I, I thought that it was a, a step for us. It's, it's always a gratifying feeling to have those moments with someone you care about so much. And it is a, a moment where you're able to step back and be like, that was, that was good for us. That was a, a, a positive step forward. I think that you can recognize that it was, was that conversation could have gone very different in the past. And it's a, a great sign for us as a, as a whole and as a couple, as, as business owners and all those different factors. Yeah, because we've definitely had before of you've asked or I've asked something in a certain way and then we see the frustration on the other person and then we respond with frustration of what better way is there to ask that? And it's like no one wants to respond to that once you've just had that frustration towards them of now they're thinking, you know what, just don't even – care about it. I just want to walk away from this conversation because I don't want to deal with what's going on there. And it it was such a positive thing to walk away from of, hey, we really took a second and instead of assuming something or just realizing there wasn't really an issue there so I can keep moving on, it was being aware of someone's feelings and but not taking so much consideration that it blunts you from having those conversations and taking those steps forward. Um, And I'm very thankful that we are surrounded by people that are open to receiving feedback and open to giving feedback. And that environment is so important because like you said, you don't want just a bunch of yes men around you and you want to be able to have someone that feels comfortable or confident giving you feedback, even if you are their superior in a sense, or like legitimately their superior, I want to be able to receive feedback from those that I'm working with and create that that space to do so. And I think being able to have open conversations and work on our feedback has helped us both within the perfectionism because 
we're not taking things so personally. And I know myself more than anyone, I would take any feedback extremely personally. I would get extremely defensive and I couldn't see that someone might be trying to help me. Or even if I didn't feel like I liked their advice, I could still take something away from that conversation and take a step forward into something better. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. Another thing that I took from the Peter Atia podcast is that one way he navigated through it and really the the big rock, and I, I don't feel like I'm I'm sharing you know, stealing from his information because he says it on every podcast. I listened to <laughs> three or four of them and he, you know, this was a main talking point for him is that his therapist had recommended that every time that he makes a mistake, he records himself giving feedback as if a friend was the one to make the mistake rather than himself. And that needs to be the frame in which he spoke to himself moving forward when he did make mistakes. And when he started this, it was something that he probably felt a little silly about. I, I don't think that he said that directly, but it felt that way of like, ah, this seems kind of ridiculous. And and early on, I think he was recording many of these voice memos and sending them to his therapist every single day. And uh, as time went on and he found himself in a situation that it was just, it was getting less and less. And then he said months later, it was something that he had completely kind of conquered it and and gotten into a much better place. And I think that framing the mistakes in that way is such a useful tool because how I would speak to you when you make a mistake is definitely not how <laughs> my negative self-talk would speak when I make this mistake myself. And so putting it in that framing and and vocally doing it, not being in in your head of, well, if, if, if Sue was to make the mistake, this is how I would address it. I think that there's value there, but there's more value to be had by actually verbalizing those, what you would, would recommend. If, if you were to make a mistake with work or I was to make a mistake with work and it was actually you, I would have so much more grace in that situation relative to being like, no, I should have just done it. And no matter what the adversity was or what the situation was, I should have gotten it done because I said I was going to get it done. And Again, there are times and places for that. I mean, there, there are certainly situations where the response should have been, yeah, I should have gotten it done. Like there actually is not grace that needs to be had. It, there's better diligence and focus that should have been had. But more often than not, it's actually a time for grace in that setting of there should have been better planning. There should have been uh, circumstances were, were skewed. We've got to give ourselves grace. We can, we can adjust. We can pivot. We can do things differently for whatever the scenario may be. And so utilizing that uh, has been helpful for me because I started to do it. I, I'm not sending it to anyone, but I have voice memos on my phone. <laughs> And I started doing it after he talked about it. And it's already been a big help for me. I would say the first episode I had listened to, he was on Huberman as well. And that was a few weeks back. So I've been doing it for maybe three-ish weeks. Um, I don't remember all the time. I'm not perfect with it. But when I do it, do do it, <laughs> it's something that is tremendously helpful and puts me at such a better place mentally and much more relaxed. Because I, I don't, anytime that you make mistakes, when, when have you ever made a mistake and I have greeted it with a bunch of anger. Like it's very infrequent, if ever, that that's the case. And definitely not the level of anger. I know that you would be speaking to yourself right. internally because sometimes, and we've both done it, of vocalizing what you're thinking of what you would be saying to yourself. And I, when he actually was saying that in the podcast, was thinking the inverse because I've recorded myself saying the very negative things to be able to listen back at a time where I'm in a more calm headspace and realize, oh my gosh, why on earth would you you speak that way to not only yourself, but just that literally was not warranted for that situation. And to get back to the beginning of you talking about being able to really discern what needs to be talked about in that way. And most of the time, it's not anything because it's not productive. Being a perfectionist didn't 
Yes, there were positive things that came from it as far as the standards I had and what I shot for in life, but it came with a massive side of negatives. The the side effects on the pill bottle was very, very long. The commercial just kept on going because they are speaking through the side effects and everything that can happen from it. And so while I can appreciate the positive that came from it, I can now see how much negative and how much things were holding holding me back by just speaking that way for absolutely no reason. And I really challenge you, if you're listening to this, to think about when you do talk to yourself that way and you are very negative, tell me something positive that's come from that. Have you improved from what you're doing? Have you felt better about yourself that day? Have you taken the step to critically think about what happened and be able to move on from it? Because I'm going to assume the answer is no. And I'm going to tell you from experience, the answer is no. Nothing positive came from it. I was just making myself feel bad to make myself feel bad, to take the easy way out and to berate myself so no one else could berate me. And that, again, got me absolutely nowhere. The final thing that I'll share today in terms of what's helped me is breathing. And I know that that sounds like, bro, we're all breathing. It's not <laughs> that big a deal. It's not as much as as you think. And, and I thought the exact same way that you did. If you're saying that, I thought that way for a very long time. And as I have focused on it and actually made a concerted effort. Actually, I'm in physical therapy right now to improve my overall breathing, which is a a wild situation in and of itself, I suppose. But by controlling your breathing and understanding that the the, sh- the shorter in and out breath and, and uh, your heart rate being elevated and all these different factors is just leading to emotional responses as a whole by having that greater control over your breathing allows for you to have greater control over your heart rate as well, thus putting you in a much better position to make decisions and to think better as, as a whole, think more logically and and tactically rather than emotionally and uh, kind of flying off the handle in those different aspects. And so by focusing on your breathing and centering yourself that way has been a tremendous help for, for me in these different scenarios and so on. I think one thing for me that I haven't mentioned has been managing expectations. And I don't mean that, again, in the way of lowering my standards or lowering my expectations, but understanding you don't always get what you want. And not that the world isn't fair. And again, I didn't, I used to think by fully understanding that I would be very negative because of that. I would feel bad because of that. But truthfully, it's allowed me so much freedom of things aren't fair in life. It's not a tit for tat of you work hard, you get X, or you do this, you get this. It's not like that. And By fully accepting that, I was able to let things roll off of me a little bit easier and, again, keep trudging forward instead of getting so stuck in the mud because it didn't go the way I wanted it to. Well, not not everything's going to go the way that you want it to. So if you truly learn, if you reflect, if you really move forward, that's how you're going to get what you want out of it and adjusting the expectation of what I did want out of it. And really what I look at each situation now is what I want out of every situation. Yeah, I'd love for things to be easy and things just go the way that I picture them in my head. But what I truly want is to improve and to be better. And the only way to improve is to put myself out there. And sometimes that includes making mistakes. Sometimes that includes falling straight on my face and not accomplishing what I thought I was going to accomplish. But that has showed me and allowed me to have so much more resilience of, I'm not going to let this keep me down. I am going to keep improving. And that's the metric of success that I look at instead of this linear path of everything's going exactly the way that I want it to. It's I'm improving. And so that's the thing that matters at the core of it and being able to be 
the version of myself and live the life that I can feel good about. Because again, I didn't feel great about the life that I was living when I was fully a perfectionist because it was never good enough. It never was what I wanted it to be. It wasn't flawless. And people could see see the insides. They could see the messy. And I didn't want that uh, to be seen. It's, an, it's enjoying the game relative to only celebrating the outcome or, or focusing too much on the outcome as a whole. And I think that the transition to that is a challenging one. But once you're there, again, it's very liberating to be in that position because one, you are much more focused on how can you improve on a day-to-day basis rather than it being these large goals. And that's the only thing that's going to make you happy as well as it puts you in a situation that when those outcomes don't come to fruition, that you actually understand what's going on. And this has been a, I am, this is all coming from experience. (laughs) This has, yeah, I'm, I'm not speaking for someone else. I'm speaking for myself here where I have been very outcome driven until the last, you know, probably two years or so, something that I've, I've had to directly work through. And Part of this is because going back to what we talked about at the beginning, that the the outcomes that I had desired, I was accomplishing. I was able to get to them because of my actions and, and all the things that I was being touted for type situation. All the things that I was wanting to happen were happening. And it just took one big thing that you know didn't happen that I wanted to happen, that I was doing the same exact stuff this whole time. It took that one experience and a lot of frustration afterwards because I didn't understand that I really recognize that it is so much more about the game rather than the outcome. And getting to that place has been probably the best thing to ever happen to me um, and has been so freeing and, and all of that. Yeah, I wanted to mention one thing in regards to competing, because I think perfectionism is a trait that a lot of competitors have of needing to be perfect in what they do. And actually, that trait was very helpful in competing because you do need to hit metrics perfectly for the most part. And I actually was able to come to a lot of peace through competing because I could see I did everything in my power to accomplish the goal. I checked every single box. I did it all. And I still, exactly what you said, I didn't have the outcome that I wanted. And that allowed me to see I controlled all of the controllables. I did everything in my power to accomplish what I needed to. I did it the right way. I did it the perfect way. And it still didn't happen. So it's not due to me not working hard enough, me not being good enough. It's due to, that's life, some of it. But it's also of Sometimes you need more time to reach that goal or you need to keep putting in the work, whatever lesson you want to learn from that. But it allowed me to let go of I did everything perfect and I still wasn't perfect enough. And instead of, again, viewing that as a major downfall, it gave me this freedom of you you can't be perfect. And that does not mean you have to lower your standards at all. It just means you have to be able to look at the context, be able to pick yourself up and keep going forward, which I did want to praise you for a few things that you've done recently. I know that I've talked about, especially in the past like six months to a year, you've seen a lot of improvement within um, perfectionism tendencies. But uh, when I asked the question of things that held you back from doing them, Actually, there are two things that you hadn't done in the past because of perfectionism that you are doing now, which is running and yoga. And those are things that you were, and you can correct me on this and speak for yourself, but for yoga, there were a kickback because maybe you just didn't want to do it or you didn't see the benefit. But I think to the core of it is you had gone to a class or two and you weren't great at it and you wanted to be great. I wouldn't even say not great. I was horrible. (laughs) That is your viewpoint of it, but sure. Uh, And you're doing it now despite not being perfect. So what has that experience been like? Because the past seven or eight weeks, you've been very consistent with it. And that's something that you were scared. And again, you can correct me if that's not the right word, scared to do beforehand. And now you're doing it. I would say, I don't know if it necessarily is scared. I think that it's more embarrassed because I am a fitness stature. I I, I carry more muscle tissue. I would say that the average person would look at me and say, he works out. 
And so for me to go into a fitness thing, being yoga and being horrible at it, freaked me out, made me like feel like a phony type situation. And by taking that plunge with yoga, I was very nervous every, every day. And one of the things that I would go into with the, the classes is that I would record a video after the class. And because I was so happy, I did it every single time, every single time I left there, I was so glad that I went. And so I just recorded a video on my phone sitting in the parking garage. It's pitch black. I mean, the the video quality is horrible, (laughs) but the audio is what I cared about the most. And I just wanted to talk to myself And I wanted, because by the time that the class got there the next week, I would start getting cold feet of like, "Ah, I've got, I've got 19 excuses I can use for this to (laughs) not go. We got lots of excuses. I got a lot of excuses that I can give here that I'm not going to go. And I would play those videos. And it was a driving force for me to keep going every single, those first handful of weeks until I started to see progression. And once I started to see progress and that I was actually getting better at it and I was enjoying it, that's when it kind of hooked me as a whole. So it took me about a month of pushing through those cold feet, watching those videos, recording the videos, and being honest with myself that I knew that if I kept up with it, that I was going to enjoy it and I was going to get better at it. And I I am so grateful that I I did. Um, And it's something that has opened me up to also wanting to try other things that I've held off on. And another thing that I really enjoy with yoga, and I've I've talked to, to Sue and Miguel about this, is that there's a point about halfway through that I start to have a little bit of a panic attack because it's a situation where it's extreme. I mean, it's hot yoga. And so it's hot and I'm struggling with some of the movements. I'm doing my best. And overcoming that panic and, and that feeling of like, oh my gosh, I need to quit. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I, I don't want to do this. I want to get up and get out. Overcoming that is such a powerful component that bleeds into the rest of my life type situation. It allows for me to welcome adversity and, and challenge with open arms relative to reluctance of, I don't want the uncomfortable nature of, of what this feeling brings. And so putting yourself in some of those more uncomfortable situations, leaning into the adversity and the challenge is a very useful tool from a life perspective that I have found through yoga. And what finally pushed you over the edge to even go? Because that was that was a huge step for you to be wanting to go. And it was you wanting to go. It wasn't anyone asking you to go or telling you to go. You wanted to go. I honestly don't know. I think that It's something where the weight of the decision finally meant enough to me. It finally meant enough to me that I wanted to take this plunge and and put myself out there. And I was willing to fail if I failed, but I I wanted to give it a shot. And so I I think that, and that's a lot of the things in my life that I I have to make the decision for myself that I'm going to do it. And I, I am not very easily influenced to make decisions. <laughs> I I have to make the decision for myself and weigh the pros and cons and, and talk about it for a little bit of time. For instance, right now, one of the things that I'm talking about semi-frequently is chess. Is And I, I've bought books and I've bought a chess set and all these different things and I haven't started. But there will be a period in maybe the near future, distant future, that I will pick up all those books and be like, it, it means enough to me now, but I want to focus on it. And so oftentimes with these different habits that I'm, I'm wanting to form, that's kind of the sequence of events that has to transpire. And, and yoga is one of those things right now that, that fits the bill. Yeah, I think that finally not speaking a truth over yourself because you used to speak the truth of I'm just not flexible. I'm not a flexible person. And so in your mind, you're always going to be bad at yoga. But you have now been like, oh, my gosh, my spine moves. I'm not just a steel rod. And do you know your body can do this? And you're showing me all these things. And uh, it's it's exciting to see of just you're you're not speaking that over yourself. And that's with and looking at my past, if I think about all the things I told myself I wasn't good at, where I might have just need more practice, or I might have just need to do it more than once to really decide that. And there are things that I'm wanting to get into. And I always used to say that I wasn't a very athletic person. And now I'm realizing I can be athletic if I just, you know, try 
And I might not be great the first time around, but I got to put myself out there. And I used to play basketball, but I I let it go. And I've said I want to get back into truly learning how to shoot. And I've opened myself up to being critiqued. And that's a big step for me of not just, okay, I'm like interested in doing this and I'm thinking about it. I've said to you, I want your help. I want you to critique me. I want to improve on this. And same thing with like throwing a ball, whether that be a baseball or a ball for the dogs. I wanted to improve on that. And you even said when I was, I was like, do you think that you could show me how to throw? You were like, I've been waiting for you to ask me. Yeah, I can show you how to do that. But I didn't want to be critiqued. I didn't want to I was just okay with saying I wasn't athletic and I couldn't do it. And because I had spoken that, then that was just the truth. And that's what people knew about me was, oh, she's not very athletic. But now I'm opening myself up to, does this mean I'm going to be the world's best baseball or basketball player? Absolutely not. But it does. It also doesn't mean that I'm just not athletic or I'm not sporty. And it's fun to be able to break some of those past truths I held on to and being able to see what can I actually do that I have told myself I can't do because I wasn't perfect at it. Yeah, I think it's recognizing that the truth that you believed was a fallacy all along. And so that's the very powerful thought process. Do you have anything else for the listeners? It's a really good conversation. I think people are going to be able to take a lot from it. I believe that's it. I really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. If you have not subscribed to the channel or left us a like, please do so now. Let us or leave us a comment as well. And I hope you have a beautiful day and see you in the next episode.